Okay, it looks like we're streaming live on Facebook. Yep. Okay, everybody. Welcome to uh, Project Healing Waters bi-weekly fly time session. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike Kelly, our host. All right. Well, uh, tonight, actually, uh, I'm not much of a host because tonight we have Larry Dostel from Cornhusker Fly Fishers and probably a lot of other organizations. But um, I've always said about Larry, I think he knows more about carp than most carp do. Uh, so I, I know he uh, uh, does a lot of carp fishing. I can't speak a lot for that. But he's going to tie some of his uh, favorite carp flies for us and uh, give us some ideas on uh, what to use for ourselves or what to use for the upcoming Charles Baswell uh, Midwest Bonefish or Great Plains Bonefish Invitational. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's a mouthful, isn't it? Right. Anyway, uh, I'll turn it over to Larry and I'll spotlight, spotlight him real quick. Um, You know, unspotlight me and we'll let Larry take over. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Larry Dostel. Um, again, like I was introduced, I, I uh, was president of Cornusker Fly Fishers for three consecutive years. Um, and I've been a carp fly fisherman, you know, going you know, over 10 years now. Um, and I've been I've been good at it for a couple of years. So, um, I've been uh, at least adept at it. I can catch carp, you know, when I try to, or when I mean to. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I have experience catching these fish all over the state of Nebraska, all over the Midwest, um, down south through Texas, uh, Louisiana. Um, I've never actually caught them in Colorado, but I've never really fished for them there. Um, so, um, but I'm tonight. I'm going to tie a couple of my favorite patterns. Um, one, actually, two of them that are be my own. Um, and then one that's just a general pattern that's that's really going to just work everywhere. It's going to work great at Lake McConaughey, but it literally it's the, it's it's on one of my rods and my boat all the time. Um, and then at the end of the at the end of my deal here, I'll I'll do a quick mulberry fly because it's mulberry season right now. So if you have a chance, if you've never caught a carp on the fly before, now is the time to try it out because uh, you know carp and 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 channel catfish and well any other grass carp. Lots of other fish are going to be hanging out near mulberry trees and, um, you know, you spin up a couple simple flies and you can just plop them down hard. You don't have to be a good caster. It's the exact opposite fishing of normal carp fishing. Um, you cast a fly down really hard and you can catch a fish. So um, normally carp are a little bit more spooky. And that's where we're going to start tonight. We're going to start with, I would say, the most quote unquote, uh, I don't know, traditional looking fly. Um, it's actually called my version of it is called a phantom roux, but it's a carp soft hackle. Now, this is an unweighted fly. Um, it, the size that we are, you're gonna tie for carp, um, it's gonna be a little bit bigger than your, you know, your traditional trout soft hackle. Um, partridge and orange is the, you know, the historical soft hackle fly that this is, that this is based on. Um, I like to use one quick note before we start. I like to use heavy stout hooks for my carp flies. That's really the only difference between a carp fly and a trout fly. It's really how stout of hook you use. Um, I'm a big fan of egg or salmon egg or glow bug style hooks. Um, the Gamakatsu C14S is the hook I would recommend that's readily available on lots of fly shops on the internet. Um, Size six is a good starting point. I tie a lot on size two in my bigger flies. And like this fly I'm gonna tie here would be on a size eight or a 10, a little bit on the smaller size. But if you just wanted one hook that's gonna cover a lot of your bases for cart flies, a size six egg or glow bug hook is a good way to go. Now, what, the, was the, what was the model of that hook again? The, the C14S. So it's, yeah, it's the Gamakatsu egg and glow bug hook. Thank you. Um, I use, yeah, and again, if, if anybody's got questions, Mike or anybody wants a clarification of something, just chime in. I mean, I, and I'll, I'll answer it as best I can anyway. Um, I'm, another, I'm a big fan of, of kind of off the beat hooks too. I like um, owner gorilla light hooks and I like the owner fly liner hooks. Now these are not your traditional fly tying hooks that you would see in a 
fly shop. Um, but they're the, you know, they're as premium quality as you really you could get. And if you're, you know, if you're consistently targeting really big fish, you know, that's, that's not a bad idea to not skimp on something. Um, so a nice sharp stout hook is what I would recommend. But again, that, that Kamikatsu C14S egg hook, you know, I'm not pay, I'm not sponsored by those guys. That's, you can't go wrong with that as a carp hook. It's got a big gap, short shank, stiff. Um, so for this fly, we're going to start with a size. This is a size eight hook. Um, and again, the size isn't necessarily the issue. It's more the technique of this fly here. So let me zoom myself in a little bit here. So we're going to, so this pattern, it's a carp soft hackle. It doesn't really mimic anything specifically. And a lot of good carp flies don't. They're kind of general patterns. They're more modern variations of like a woolly bugger. Um, that's how I like to think of carp flies anyway. Um, so <clears throat> start with your hook in, the, hook in the vise. And I'm just using 140 denier thread. Um, this is a pretty simple fly. It's going to be just some pheasant tail for the tail, some, <clears throat> um, some simple dubbing, which I had out and I lost it. I like, a, I like an artificial kind of nymph dubbing. I, I use a lot of fly tires dungeon materials because they're really inexpensive and the guy mixes them and makes colors himself. Um, this is the pseudo peacock dubbing. And I think, it's, I think he calls it that because it's got kind of a mix of colors into it, which I like a lot. So um, really simple peacock um, tail for the tail. Or not peacock, this is pheasant tail, sorry. This is a pheasant tail, not a peacock. I said peacock. This is a pheasant tail, um, some dark. This is like purple kind of um, peacock style dubbing. And then I'm a big fan of hen saddle hackles. Uh, you know, your traditional wet fly kind of saddle hackles. You know, you, wouldn't, you, would, not, you would not tie a dry fly with this stuff. This is really soft. The barbs are kind of uh, floppy and the actual fibers on the feathers are really soft. I mean, you're, it, it's, it's, when it gets in the water, it's gonna pulsate and breathe a little bit. So for this specific fly, I'm a fan of Grizzly soft hackle. Now you can use, again, the, the main takeaways I want you to take away from everything I'm tying tonight is mainly the techniques and placement of materials. You can vary them all you want, you know, in terms of color, in terms of, you know, what sink rate you want. This is an unweighted fly on a pretty heavy hook. So it isn't, it's not like it's going to, you know, float. It's still going to slowly sink. Um, so first things first, I'm just going to lay down a thread base. This is just 140 denier, you know, whatever, whatever drab color. To me, this fly specifically, it doesn't have to exactly mimic, doesn't have to match any color of the fly because this is going to be a little bit of a mix of a couple different colors. Um, and then when I, the first things first, as I strip maybe, you know, six, maybe half a dozen pheasant tail fibers. Um, and I like that. I like to go, it, it, I guess it depends how, what, what, uh, quality of, of pheasant tail you get, but I like the, um, I like the ones that from the colorful side, if you don't get, if you don't get the main biggest pheasant tail, uh, fe feather, um, Sometimes half of them are pretty drab and then the other half have that kind of colorful kind of sheen to them. That's, that's the ones we want to use. So I'm just going to strip, you know, a little bit off here and then I'm just going to start cutting what I need. So I have a bundle of, oh, maybe seven, eight of those pheasant tail fibers. And what I want for length here, I'm just going one hook shank length for the tail. So I kind of just will measure, <clears throat> you know, I'll, I'll just place those fibers right on top of the shank here. And then that's going to be where, where I start tying them in. I'm just going to move that back. And that's going to be the overall length of my fly. And I'm just going to start. So I, I'm a big fan of filling the shank with my thread and the tying material. That just seems to make for a more durable fly in the long run. So I've, I, I kind of measured my materials and then I'm just going to start tying them in right behind the hook eye. I'm just going to start there. 
I'm going to go all the way back. And that's the first step. So I'm going to trim off this excess pheasant tail here. If you wanted to fold it back, I guess you could. So now this is where I add dubbing. And I'm, if you, if you wanted to get fancy here, you could do a, a wire rib. I don't, I don't think it's super necessary for the way I do a dubbing. I kind of, I do like a double layer of dubbing just with a very thin dubbing noodle. You could say I do the, I like the touch dubbing technique, especially for this fly. And then I'll pick, I'll put it on in a couple layers, then I'll pick it out later. So first things first, I'm going to just add just a little bit of wax to my thread. And then this dubbing, I'm, I, I like to snip off. It's, this is a little bit longer dubbing and it's mostly synthetic and it, it's kind of doesn't come up the best on there, but there's, there's a bunch of different colors on here. It kind of mimics a peacock, um, a peacock uh, hurl. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pinch myself off some there and then I'm just gonna start applying it to my thread with just the, you know, the, the spin, the noodle technique here. And then I'm just going to fill the shank up and I'm going to give myself, I'm only going to go to one hook eye width behind the hook eye. That's going to be kind of my measurement. And that's where I'm going to leave myself room to tie in that hackle feather for a collar. So I'm just going to fill the shank with dubbing and I'm going to go, I'm actually instead of, and, then, and again, instead of doing a wire rib like you would maybe with a woolly bugger or a Prince nymph or something, I'm just going to go over it a couple times with my thread and at the bottom. So this body, I put on a pretty thick noodle there. To me, that body has enough hackle on it. It's going to be fine. So I kind of just cross wrap my thread over it and I'm going to make myself a little space to tie in my soft hackle here. So for this pattern, again, because I like it to mimic any kind of nymph that's swimming. I mean, this could be a damselfly. This could be a small bait fish, really, if, it, if a carp squinted enough. Um, I like the grizzly hackle because it, that, that kind of patterning when you wrap it around a hook, that black and white kind of speckling, it kind of implies movement in the water a little bit. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in these soft hackle fibers. They're all, these soft hackle feathers, all of the fibers are kind of soft and fluffy and they'll move in the water. I don't really need the really, really fluffy stuff on the bottom. So I'm just going to strip that off just to make my life a little easier here. <clears throat> that way. Um, and there's a couple of different ways of technique to, to tie this in. I'm a fan of tying it in from the tip angle and not from the base. Um, a lot, I mean, some dry fly techniques you like to tie from the base, but I'm a fan of tying it of actually making myself, I'll grab the very tip of the feather and strip down and kind of stroke the fibers down and then kind of exposes just the tip of the feather there. And what I like to do is trim that off to make just a little notch. It's like almost a little pyramid there. You can see it kind of against my hand, that black, it's like black and white little pyramid. And that's gonna be my tie-in point. So if, if I know I, if I wrap thread around that whole little pyramid, that little triangle I make there, I know it's really secure to the hook and it shouldn't come undone when I'm, when I'm doing my palmering here. So <clears throat> I like to tie with, the, with, this, with this fly, you know, the curvature, the, the natural curvature of that feather. I like to put it with the, you know, with the grain of the fly in this one. It's not going against it, maybe like a dry fly, like an Adams would. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna line up that little tab that I created for myself and just capture that with my thread, go over it a couple times. Um, and here's where I, sometimes I like to just do a quick little half hitch just so my thread doesn't you know, come undone and, and lose this hackle. So now, um, depending on how articulate you are, you can use your, your, if your vice is rotary, you can use a rotary vice. I am still just a fan of just hand wrapping it because it gives me control. I can, what I can do is I can preen these feathers back as I'm wrapping it. And that allows me to get good, even coverage. And really you're looking for maybe one, I mean, if you get, if you get two good wraps, like that's like more than enough to give your motion to your fly. The more you wrap, the slower this fly is gonna sink, which you may want in your fly. 
if you really want it to just hang up in the in the surface film which at lake mcconaughey believe it or not even in the deepest water right by the dam a lot of times the carp there are just hanging around looking up at this floating detritus and, and algae and this scum and all kinds of stuff that's on the water and a, and a neutral buoyant very slow sinking very soft landing fly like this soft hackle just kind of just landed out in front of them and then strip back in front of their face you know they'll just instinctively just turn to eat it because it looks like food to them so i have my i have my hackle secured and i'm just going to trim off the stem of that soft hackle feather and then now you're you're essentially done so what i'm going to do is i'm just going i i had i just hand whip finish two three four but you can do a whip finishing tool if you want Um, and it's, again, this is a very, very simple fly. Once you get the hang of it, of this technique, you know, it's three, it's, it's really simple. Three materials, a tail, a body, and a, and a collar. I mean, it's essentially a deconstructed woolly bugger when you, when you really think about it. Um, it doesn't look like much, but that's okay. You let the fish see food in it. You know, it's, impre it's an impressionistic pattern. You could tie it without the tail if you want. Um, I kind of like the tail on there. Um, and you could kind of scuff up, you know, you can use a needle or a bodkin or, a, you know, a, a gun cleaning brush or something and you kind of, you can pluck out some of that dubbing. You can add thicker dubbing if you want, but that's essentially it. So that's this pattern specifically, this kind of color scheme, this like, you know, dark bodied, lighter hackled with a pheasant tail. I call it the phantom rue. And it's based off of I don't know if there's any, you know, cryptozoologist fans out there, any Bigfoot followers. Well, we don't have Bigfoot in Nebraska. The thing that's native to Nebraska or the thing that's rumored to be haunting Nebraska is the phantom kangaroo. And actually on a trip out to McConaughey in a, this would have been maybe 2015. I was driving with one of my friends with Dan Frazier and we're, we get past Kearney and there, you know, sometimes there's a couple farms out there, a couple livestock farms. And we drive by one and he's like, Hey, that, I swear to saw a kangaroo, you know, we're going, you know, 85 on I 80, you know, speeding probably. He's like, I swear I saw a kangaroo. And it's like, no, what, no way did you see a kangaroo? And we turn around, of course, we turn around at the next exit, kind of come back and, you know, we didn't, it, we, it was gone. It was long gone. I was like, are you sure you didn't see a jackrabbit? He's like, no, I, I know what a kangaroo looks like. Okay, Dan. Um, but it, <laughs> it turns out he started, you know, he got on his phone, got on the Google, and he, uh, he's like, oh, phantom kangaroo. He's like, that, that's like the, there's, there's sightings of it and all this stuff. And he looked, you know, it was a kangaroo that existed at the time of dire wolves. And anyway, it's, it's probably not real, but it might be. Um, so. That's, that's a simple fly, a simple soft hackle. Um, now we're gonna tie a fly that uses essentially the same order of techniques, except we're gonna make it a sinking fly. Um, and this is an infinitely, this is the, the actual fly that has spawned all manner of, you know, it, it's, it's, really, it's really the modern, carp fly that every angler should have a variant of of some form or another we're going to tie the black betty so it's essentially this same this same style of fly you know a tailing material a simple body and a soft hackle kind of collar um just with some weight on it to make it you know to make it a woolly bugger with clouser eyes or maybe you know uh, maybe a, a better comparison would maybe be a like a crazy charlie or, or a bonefish fly so um, same hook. You can use a size six, size eight, size two um, of that of that B10S hook, or not B10S, uh, C14S Gamakatsu. Um, this right here is that owner fly liner hook. Um, <clears throat> so same deal. I'm going to lay down a thread base first, and that's just this that uh, 140 denier. I like UTC. It's just uh, it's always consistent. It lays flat on your hook. <clears throat> so there's one little trick i will say this the materials for this fly are going to be very similar i'm going to use the same dubbing that same dark purple dubbing that has some you know has some other kind of reds and greens in there 
Um, I'm going to use an all black saddle, a hen saddle, soft hackle for the collar. But the tailing material is actually going to be red vinyl cording. Um, at a fly shop, this stuff is your D rib, your vinyl rib. Your D rib is it's just because it's shaped like a D. It's flat on one side, so you can you know you can wrap a nice even body. Um, v rib is typically just round. This is called vinyl ribbing. You know you can make rib ribbing out of it. This is I bought this just on the I think from Amazon or eBay, and it's called crystal thread. And it's essentially the same thing. It's just a little bit thicker diameter. Um, but I have like a lifetime supply of it for like $2 instead of $2 for like two feet of it. Um, so I'm just going to trim myself just a little section of that. And that's what's going to be our tail for this fly. Um, the same exact fly technique I'm showing you, if you instead sub the tail for a piece of ultra chenille, some San Juan worm chenille, then you have a John Montana hybrid. Um, hybrid worm, which is another staple fly that you want in your box in Nebraska. Um, but we're tying the Black Betty variant. So this variant, I like to weight it for general purpose use, you know, that I'm going to tie on my, you know, rod most of the time fishing, you know, up to like maybe four feet. I'm going to use large or extra large black bead chain. And that's, I mean, you can use silver. I mean, I just like black because it just blends in with the fly. It doesn't add any extra flash that's not needed. Um, one little trick that helps your fly kind of, this, this fly is gonna end up riding hook point up in the water, or at least I prefer that too. So one little trick that adds, again, kind of adds durability to your fly and helps it turn over a little bit, in my experience, is I actually put my, put my vinyl rib on first and I tie it kind of similar. I just, I have my thread ready to go right behind the hook eye here. And that's where I'm starting my fly. And I'm just letting it trail off in the end. I'm gonna let it trail off a lot and I'll just trim it to the final length once I'm done with the fly here. So I'm just gonna capture it down, kind of fold it over. And I'm making sure that I'm keeping this material on top of the hook shank. And that's gonna help me secure my bead chain eyes here in just a minute. So there you go. My thread is captured that vinyl rib. And again, this is not the final link. We'll trim that at the end. So now I'm gonna take my extra large bead chain and depending on the depth that you wanna fish or how windy it is, um, you're gonna to wanna to vary this weight here. So um, brass eyes are great for, you know, being a little bit heavier than these. Lead eyes or even tungsten dumbbell eyes, which are pricey but really heavy, you know, that's going to let you get deeper quicker and it's going to let you cut through the wind and maybe some wave action, which is a factor at like Lake McConaughey and Lake Ogallala. It's windy there all the time. Um, so that little bit of extra weight, this gives you control for where you want your fly to go. You know, it might splash the fly down harder, but if it's really windy or it's really wavy, that that doesn't really matter because the, the cart will be distracted by the waves anyway. So um, a good rule of thumb too is this line up your eyes. Again, one hook eye width back. That's gonna be kind of your starting point um, here. So I'm just gonna figure eight, wrap this in, you know, kind of do a couple wraps one way, do a couple wraps the other way, just to kind of get it started. Then I'm gonna kind of do some figure eights. And then I'm going to come underneath, kind of bind those together. Should be good to go. Now, you can, just like any other fly that has like a dubbing body or a, you know, nymph style body, you can add a piece of wire here if you want to rib it. I'm, I'm just not in the, I'm just, I don't do it. I just, I skip that step. That's just how I roll. If you want to make your flies really, really pretty and, and potentially last longer, go for it. I would lean towards not the shiniest, brightest um, wire. I would just use kind of just a, a copper color or just a simple brass color. Um, but say, so similar to the other fly, I'm just going to kind of start myself a little dubbing noodle here. It's going to wax my thread a little bit. 
grab the, you know, grab the old corner here and just start pinching some of this dubbing. <clears throat> and that, that usually just helps align it a little bit. And it, it just kind of helps you orient those fibers just in a way that they just spin right on your thread. I'm assuming um, you guys know how to do that technique. So if, if, if anybody's got questions or anything, we can, we can kind of come back to that. But this is just a, this is just called the touch dubbing technique here. So this one, it's okay to go a little bit thicker on the body. So I like to, I like to kind of fill that body up and leave yourself just a little space behind those hook eyes because behind those B chain eyes, because that's where the, your hackle is going to go. So then I just take my thread and again, in lieu of doing a ribbing, I just take my thread back over my dubbing that I just did and it captures it really well. And then if I, and if I capture too much of her or if the body's too thin, I'll go back over it with just another really thin dubbing noodle. And that'll, you know, that'll kind of cover up my wraps that I just did. And it's still very durable. I mean, I've had flies like this where I've caught 10 fish on them before they've fallen apart. So I think they do their job. And the good thing about carp is you don't have to worry about teeth like you do with trout. You bet. Yeah, even, I mean, any carp, they don't really, they don't have any of those small teeth, so they don't really tear flies up. I mean, it's just, just the act of a carp fighting is what's going to, you know, tear your fly up. So, and that's going to happen either way. So now I just advance my thread right behind the hook eye. And now I'm just going to grab one of my black um saddle hackles here and again this is a hen saddle you can use hen for this style of fly for the hybrids for the soft hackles you can use pheasant hackle you can use hen necks which i you know which i like magnum hen necks the, you know the really wide fat short feathers um all kinds of colors um you, this isn't you know the hens the, the chicken feathers are inexpensive which is nice and you and it lets and they're very easy to work with it's kind of not a lot of drawbacks to them. Natural, natural uh, feathers like partridge and uh, pheasant, they have a lot more going on in the speckling and kind of color spectrum they give off. So, I mean, if you're a hunter and have those, you know, patches of feathers kicking around, like, um, and duck feathers work really, really well for that too. You know, teal and mallard flank feathers, they have a lot of natural kind of, kind of speckles and stuff. Um, but for, Inexp you know, for ease of a bit availability and inexpensiveness, like you can't beat these. I mean, you know, less than 10 bucks, you have, you know, a lifetime supply of this stuff, really. So I like to pluck, you know, one from kind of the, the you know, this is towards the neck of the chicken. This is like more towards like the saddle. And I like, a, I like a little bit wider feather here. So I kind of pick more towards the, the back of the chicken. And that's and that's what that's going to do is just going to give a little bit wider collar and it's going to help the fly land softer. Um, just like before, we don't need this really fluffy marabou like stuff at the bottom. So I'm just going to strip that off just so it's out of the way. And if you, you know, if you're a fan of that in your fly, go for it. You know, put leave it on there if you really like that fluffy stuff. Um, for this pattern specifically, you don't really need it. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start preening back. And like, this is what, this is what I'm going to add to the fly here. Just like this section and this, and right here, I'll snip it and give me that little tying tab. Now, if you're really persnickety, you know, you can tie two or three flies with one of these feathers, but again, that's up to you. So just like the other fly, I'm, um, you know, I'm going, the, I want the curvature to go with the fly here. I want it to go back this way. So I'm placing that little tab that I made, that little, you can kind of, you can see it better with this feather, right behind the bead chain eyes. And I'm going to capture it with my thread. And I'm going to actually, right now, I'm just going to advance my thread above the hook eye or, uh, you know, above the eyes, just so it's out of the way. So just like that first fly, I'm going to preen these feathers back just so they kind of lay, you know, go with the flow of my wrapping here. And since, 
you know, if this was a woolly bugger, if I was really advanced, you know, filling a body and advancing the, the palm ring forward, that's where I would use a, you know, I would use the rotary function. But really, you're wrapping these, these wraps like right on top of each other. And it's easier to me to control that just with one hand and just going over and under like this. So I'm, and again, I just used all of those wraps. So that was like, what, four wraps there? And I, I bring it, and this is where I get a little handsy. I kind of come back and I, I throw one wrap with my left hand over that just so it's kind of captured. And, I, and then I grab, you know, I, I, I do stuff really quick that I don't even realize what I do sometimes. Once you, once you get in the habit of tying flies, you, you just do stuff. Get that muscle memory. So then I capture that down and it, it, it should be good to go there. So I'm going, what I'm going to do is just trim off that stem. And now, this isn't necessary, but I like to do another fairly thin noodle of dubbing and just fill in. So you can see I did, I did a different color thread just so you could see this. This is that olive. You know, there's gap there. You could just end the fly right now. If you use black thread, it would be good to go. I have this dark dubbing. I'm going to fill in around that hook eye or the, the bead chain dumbbell eye, and then I'm going to tie it off here. So I'm just going to do very, very thin know, basically barely thicker than the thread dubbing noodle. And let's do a couple figure eight wraps, just kind of just evens it out just a little bit. And then I'm just going to be done. I'm just going to tie it off right there, right at the hook eye. One, you know, and usually two whip finishes, you know, will make your fly pretty durable. I'm a big fan of doing a little dab of super glue. Um, it's of my opinion that carp don't really smell super glue and you're not fooling them with your, with their sense of smell anyway. They really should not be smelling it for that long, at least in most circumstances. And I mean, most of the circumstances that you're gonna fish for them in Nebraska, for instance. Um, it's a visual eat. They're seeing the fly and they're like, oh, that looks like food and then they're eating it. They're gonna reject it because it doesn't look or act like food. Not because it smells weird. If you you know if you're fishing for carp with like worms or bait, they are definitely smelling it then and tasting it. So that's a different ball game. I'm not worried about scent and that scent might not be soluble in water anyway, so that, I I mean that, there's no proof that they can really even smell it, you know, in my opinion. So I got this big long tail here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim it just a little bit and you know you can kind of measure here if you want. Just a little bit longer than the body. So I mean, just a hair, and you can always make it shorter, and you can always do no tail, and it would just be a weighted soft tackle. But that's it. That's the black Betty. That's how I like to tie them. And again, it doesn't really look like anything specifically. Um, the guys that invented, the, you know, that popularized this style of fly, and then the John Montana hybrid. You know, if you if you made a tail with know san juan worm pink or any color um if they actually mimic when it sits on the bottom like that it kind of looks like a freshwater clam or a mussel and that can be like the clam's foot or something like that um yeah i mean that that's definitely what it could be mimicking um all i know is it really catches fish like really well i mean this would be the best bluegill fly you ever threw too if you want um but um, it's just a simple nymph. It lands relatively soft because it's got that collar on it. You know, it looks, the front half of it looks like a bug. Um, it can look like a leech. If you tie this in all tan, which I'm a fan, a fan of, tan and browns, olives, you know, then it looks like maybe a juvenile crayfish or a damselfly nymph. Um, you can vary the color of the tailing material. Um, you can go straight tail material. You can go with uh, pheasant tail. Um, one key to this color, if, if you're having, you know, especially beginning carp fly fishermen, is you can make it a bright color tail. You can make it bright pink. And that lets you, it lets the angler see and track your fly. And if, you know, you know your fly is in front of a carp and then it disappears, you don't see it anymore. Oh, that carp ate it and you could set the hook. Um, so, these, so these are the two, you know, your two natural, you know, your, so, your plain soft tackle and your, you know, kind of weighted nymph soft tackle, you know, that, that covers, you know, your top part of your column, 
and then you know you're getting into your flats fishing or your dapping fishing with the you know with the nymph um any oh, any questions or anything right now while everybody while we're kind of just sitting here okay we'll move it along the last fly well actually the second to last fly is one that i'm going to tie it's called the four-eyed worm now that's kind of a goofy name i'll admit it and it's not because the fly has glasses or anything, but I use a section of four of those large bead, large bead chains. So this is a really, it's basically a weighted San Juan worm. Let me just change out my thread here so it looks cool. And I like using, I like using, uh, pink and I like using natural tan, but you can make this an olive and it looks like a damselfly nymph. Um, you can make it in banana split. You can do two different colors, but we're just gonna tie one for now. And we're just gonna use that same hook. And this hook, in this fly, you can use a bigger hook actually. I'm gonna use a little bit bigger hook. I'm gonna use that number two that has like more of a gap. That look, that's a lot like the big size of the Gamakatsu B10S. That's the same shape of it. You know, pretty standard. It's got a short shank, but a big gap. Pretty stout, thick wire. Um, I switched to pink thread specifically for this fly, but you can use white or you can use red. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill this shank with thread. And I'm going to, for this one, I'm going to go up, go down the bend of the hook just a little bit. Not 100% necessary, but just a little bit. And then I'm going to get myself a big chunk of this ultra chenille. So this is just, this is like fluorescent bright pink San Juan worm ultra chenille. And this fly, you want to use ultra chenille or vernille um, because it doesn't come undone under stress. You know, your standard chenilles, your, some of your woolly bugger chenilles, um, they're not as tightly wound and it's just a different process to make them the, the twisting of that fiber. Um, they just come, will come undone for this type of fly. Um, ultra chenille just does not come undone, which is nice. So uh, start that start. What I like to do is I like to just like that last one where I do the tailing material first. Again, this is how I like to tie it because it helps the a little bit. It helps the bead chain kind of stay put a little bit. I like to lash down a section on top of the hook shank. And if you were doing two different colors, if you were going to do the banana split variant, like a natural tan with the pink body, um, my friend Joe, who is going to be a guide out at, uh, out there at McConaughey, he, he's like, oh, this, you know, this is the banana split variation of this life. And it, it works awesome. So if you want... I, tie, I like to tie in a section first of whatever color it's going to be. And this one's just going to be all pink. And I'll, I'll, I like to trim it off maybe two hook shank lengths back. So that's going to be the length of the fly. And you could always make it shorter. And then I bring that, you know, my, my extra or whatever color you're going to make the body out of. I tie that down in the same spot. So I advance my thread back. And I lash it down. And what this does is this makes a nice wide base for you to lash down your bead chain eyes and again this is just my opinion and experience don't sue me um <laughs> so this so here i go this is that same extra large um bead chain black bead chain i'm a fan of just the black um you can use gold again you can use whatever color you have um i would i would tend to do a bigger diameter you know, use the extra large, use the large for this because you want the weight. And the nice thing about this, I'll show you at the end. Um, I like to tie this one. I like to give myself probably a little bit more play here. So I like to give myself a gap of maybe one of the bead chain eyes back from the hook eye. Um, and that allows you to, that allows me to do a couple wraps up ahead. And it, <clears throat> that's just how I like to tie it. Some other guys, my friends, they tie it They'll move the boot bead chain all the way up and basically just tie it off right there. I like to leave it back a little bit. It seems to let the fly kind of rest a little bit better on the on the on the bottom of whatever body of water I'm fishing. So I'm just figure eight wrapping this just like you would for a clouser.
and then kind of cinching it off, putting some tension on it there. And then I'm moving my thread just right behind the hook eye and I'm going to just do a half hitch just so it doesn't go anywhere. So now, now is where you can definitely do the, you know, rotary function if, it, if you like to. Um, you just keep tension on and you're literally just making a nice, smooth, fat worm body. I am just, I'm just a fan. I just, to me, it just kind of goes smoother and faster if I just go a hand over hand method like this. Um, when you get to, I like to do wraps in and around my figure eight, you know, where I attach the hook eye here or attach my B chain. I mean, that's just me. Um, I like to kind of do one, you know, cross wrap. And then you could do a straight one and then you kind of do another cross wrap and it fills that whole middle section out. Um, and then I can do one out in front of the B chain and capture it down. That, that tech, you know, filling that gap there, that's really just going to be personal preference. <laughs> you know, and, and again, you can kind of leave that bare if you have the same color hook eye or color uh, thread to your body material. And then I'm just, I just capture that, that uh, chenille down and then I'm just gonna trim it off right there. Make myself a little thread head just for a little bit durability, a little bit of durability here. A couple of, couple of whip finishes. And again, there's nothing wrong with hitting this with some head cement or some super glue just to lock everything down. So there you go. The thing about this fly, I, I really like using this in the Papio Creek, but it works really well. I've caught a lot of fish on it on Lake Ogallala proper. And the, those four B chain eyes, first off, they rattle a little bit. If I mean, you can't really hear it, maybe. But what it does is it allows that fly to really just sit just like that on the bottom. So in current, and, and low current, it'll just sit right there and a carp, you know, doesn't have trouble seeing it and eating it and getting hooked. And you're not, you know, sna constantly snagging on the bottom typically. Um, yeah, so that, to me, that tail's a little bit long. I like to do it a little bit shorter. Um, if you're worried about, the, you know, the thread, the taper, that's kind of squared off. You can use a lighter and kind of just singe the end of it and it'll really lock those fibers in. But that's, that's essentially it. And that might look like a lot of hook, you know, exposed there. But really, the carp doesn't focus on the hook. They, they see that bright color and it's, you know, it's instantly attractive to them. And the nice thing about tying this, you know, this fly in your, in your kind of khaki, you know, natural tan or your, you know, your fluorescent pink is you as an angler can see it really, really well. Um, if you tie it in like olives or you know, like a perp, you know, or, or whatever other color you're, you know, all black or olive, you know, it's harder for you to see in at depth, but you know, then it looks, you know, this fly just looks like a damselfly nymph for maybe a little leech or something. It doesn't have a lot of motion. I mean, that, that ultra chenille wiggles a little bit in the water, but really it's just the profile of, a, oh, it's a worm in the water. And this one just happens to just sit nice and easy. Um, and if you, and if for some reason, I mean, there's, there's no reason you couldn't just do a two-eyed worm too, and just to have, have a weighted San Juan worm that, tr that rides hook point up. I mean, I have, my, box is, I, my box is half full of these worms, and then everything else is other carp flies. Um, these flies work really well around here. They work good in dirty creeks, you know, and, and like the salt, you know, the Papio Creek, the Salt Creek, Oak Creek. Um, they work well around here, but they've worked good in the prairie lakes in South Dakota. I caught literally a dozen fish on one of these in Lake Ogallala a couple of years ago. Um, it's just a good carp fly. My, my buddy in Wisconsin, that is a carp guide. He uses these a ton. Um, simple, you could call it a guide fly because it's literally just like two materials, but it works well. You don't really need to get super fancy in my opinion with carp. Um, well, what time we got here? It is almost seven. 47 yeah anybody well, anybody have any questions I yeah does anybody few, have any questions does anybody else cart have flies questions? cart fishing anything I mean, Harry, we do not have a time limit on this so as long as you need as long as you want okay well 
tis the season. So right now we're at the very kind of beginning of when the mulberries are dropping here in Nebraska anyway. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's just like anywhere else, the warmer it is, you know, the earlier it happens. Um, but really, but I caught, I've caught mulberry fish this year already, the last like week and a half. Um, so I'm going to show you a very, I mean, it's just, a, it's just a very simple mulberry fly. Um, there, the thing is, there, it is interesting. There are white mulberries and then there's red, purple mulberries, and then there's like really dark black mulberries. Um, the material we're going to use for this fly um, is just baby blanket yarn. Now, Walmart or, you know, most of your craft stores or Michaels or Hobby Lobby, whatever, Joanne's Fabric, they'll have, they have a couple different kinds of this stuff. Um, I think it's Burnett is the company. They have a baby blanket yarn, which they have like a lot of the whites and like light pinks and stuff with that, which will make a very serviceable, you could tie all this on this, like this white baby blanket and then just use a Sharpie in this color purple. Um, the yarn that is like the ideal is this, it's this Patton's Bohemian yarn, which I don't think they make anymore. So you have to kind of like buy it off eBay or pay me a bunch of money and I'll maybe cut you a couple of feet of it. Um, but it's a, what the stuff essentially is, it's just a really thick chenille is that's really all it is. I mean, it's nothing too fancy. Um, and what you're gonna do is just do a couple wraps of it on a hook and you just got a perfect mulberry that sinks. Now, if you're if you're a big geek and you like to you know catch carp on the you know or any fish like on the surface, um, you can use deer hair spun just like a popper, um, and they'll and that'll float. Or if you do it kind of sparse, it'll like float and slowly, slowly sink, which is like that's what a mulberry typically does. It sinks you know either fast or kind of slowly. Um, or you can make one out of foam. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, I'm a big fan. If you're just going to tie one, I would just tie these ones that just plop and kind of slowly sink like this out of this chenille. Again, that's just how I, I've caught a lot of fish on them like that. And the slow sinking, it's easier for like the catfish, your, your channel catfish to eat it too, which you'll def, if they're around, you'll definitely interact with those. And that's a lot of fun too. If you never caught a catfish on a fly rod, it's a hoot. So I'm just using, I'm just using back to my white, 140 denier just because I don't buy purple thread I don't really I wouldn't I would only use it for this um I'm just going to sharpie it at the end purple so so I just lay myself a nice little thread base down and you could go I mean they they sell there's all kinds of different purple chenilles you can buy at the store you know buy at the here here's like a fly shop version of one it's got some sparkle in it it doesn't look purple on there it's totally purple so uh, I mean, they're fly, you know, you can get these at your fly fishing section. Well, maybe if Carolas doesn't have a whole lot of their fly selection anymore. So um, if you want to be anatomically correct with your berries, you know, you can use a make a stem out of, you know, you can this I have green of that crystal string. You can just use a yellow or a green little chunk of silly legs or, uh, you know, rubber leg material. Um, so I'm just going to tie, I'm just got a little bit of a green stem here. I'm just going to lay that on the top of the hook shank. Just fill the shank with it. No big deal. This adds durability. It won't pull out. And you could trim off the access, excess and use more later. So this, um, this chenille, just to add durability to this fly, it's super simple. And, you know, he's, you can catch big fish with it. What I like to do is take the end of it. And I'll I'll kind of start fluffing it out, and you'll expose that core. So a chenille is it's like a pipe cleaner. It's basically, you know, a strand of thread or a strand of wire that has other materials sandwiched between it, and then they spin it, and it just captures. It makes you know it makes a round thread or or whatever dubbing brush if you make your own of those. But anyway, I'm exposing that thread and then I'm gonna kind of pinch that down. And that's gonna be where I initially tie this fly in. And I'm gonna start back again, maybe two, one or two hook eye widths back. And I'm just gonna start right where I expose that inner core of the chenille. 
And what I'm going to do to again to add a little bit of weight or not weight, but kind of volume body to this fly and durability, I'm actually going to tie over my you know capture this chenille down back to my the base of my uh, stem there. So I'm just going to wrap back. And really, you know, you want to do a couple of hard, you know, a couple of authoritative wraps right where you're, you know, at the base of the stem, if you tie the stem in, um, just so you know, it's just so it's not spinning around the hook, because that's going to be your kind of weak point, wherever you tie, wherever you start turning this, if you tie it in at the very back, or you do my technique where you wrap, you know, you fill the body with it and capture it down with a bunch of thread wraps, the weakest point is going to be right where you cap, you know, where you make the turn to, to wrap it forward, palmer it forward. So I'm moving my thread back up to the hook eye. Again, I like to, this is a thing that I like to do is I like to just do a whip finish. Whenever I move my thread before I palmer something, just do, just do a quick whip finish with your finger, literally just wrap the thread around your finger, touch the hook eye, and then just kind of slide that thread off. And that just lock, that just makes it so your, your fly, you know, your, thread doesn't come undone and you don't lose wraps or anything like that. Um, it's not a big deal on a big fly like this. You know, it just kind of, this is, a, to me, it's a good habit to get into if you're tying a bunch of flies quickly. So now this is pretty secure. It's not like that tie point. It's not spinning around the hook. It's not loose where I'm going to start palmering it. Now I'm probably going to do, this is a smaller hook shank. I'm probably only going to do four wraps, but I'm going to do them pretty tight. One, two, three, four. Yeah, that's all I'm gonna do. I don't wanna crowd, you don't wanna crowd the eye too much because this is a really thick chenille and wrapping it and capturing it with your thread. See, capturing it with your thread can give yourself unwanted, unwanted bulk. It can just make it, it can make it difficult. So, so what I'm gonna do, again, this is, <clears throat> it's a little bit, to, to capture this really well, to capture this chenille and tie it down well, in my experience, it's kind of gets a little handsy because you want to keep it kind of tight. You don't want it being loose in here because if it's loose, it's going to kind of, after one or two big fish, it's going to come unraveled. Um, so make sure you have, you're kind of keeping tension a little bit on this chenille. And then you're coming up and over and then you're starting to capture it. So I like to go I like to capture it once. So here's my capture wrap once. And then I'd like to do one or two wraps in front of the material. So I'm actually building a couple layers of capturing it. It's overkill. And then and for like a dry fly or something like that, you would be building up so much bulk. But we're not tying a dry fly here. We're trying to, we're tying a fly that you plop like a, you know, like a meteor coming out of the sky. So I do, I literally do that maybe four times. And then I, and then it's really secured. Like you kind of, like, if you do it right, you kind of isolated that, this thread. I mean, it's not going anywhere now. And what you can do is you can just trim it off. Don't, don't, I say that and then I knock my bottom around. And no matter, no matter how you do it, this big thick, thick chenille, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, it's almost as thick as the hook gap. If you, if it's, you know, not compressed down, you're going to have like a big tuft that's now it's in between. It's like sticking out of some thread wraps. Well, if you go over those thread wraps, if you go over those, you could kind of see it here. So here's the white. And then you see this kind of tuft that's sticking out. Well, I'm going to capture that with a bunch of thread wraps. So I'm going to make a kind of a, a little bit of a big bulky head. But really, it's going to be this. It's going to make this fly super durable. Just make sure you're nice and tight, and cat, and just kind of go over that purple. And if and this is easy to see if you're using like a white or like a lighter colored thread because you'll because essentially that tuft will just disappear. And now you can uh, you know half hitch or whip finish and you're done. One tip I would say. Um, if you're gonna do if you're, like like me, if you're going to color these with like a Sharpie, just because you don't have that color purple thread, um, I like to glue, if you're gonna glue them, glue them first 
uh, let it dry like super glue, like do a dab of super glue and just give it, you know, 10, 15 minutes, let it completely cure, then come back with your, with your Sharpie after that. Um, if you're not going to super glue it, just kind of just start touching the, touching the thread with a Sharpie. If Again, this is if you don't have purple or black thread, like some kind of cheapskate or something. Um, there you go. You got a, I got a mulberry there. So now that that tail is really long, the, the stem on a mulberry is really, I mean, it's like, may, I mean, at most half an inch. I mean, not, it's, it's not much. I mean, it's probably, a, it's probably like half of a hook length there. So that's my main, that's like the main mulberry fly that I would throw like nine times out of 10. Um, if you do, if you do tie a foam, a high floating foam one, um, you know, this is a really good dropper to, you know, just tie off the hook shank. I like, I like to do a dry dropper with them. It works really well. Um, you get two presentations and then you have one that's kind of dank, you know, this, this fly will slowly sink below a, a floating dropper. And, it, and, you know, you never know if the, if the fish isn't willing to commit to the surface, then you, a lot of, you'll get them on this one. I mean, it's like nine times out of 10, you catch them on the, the dropper. Um, but if you want to be a carp dry fly purist, just use the floater and catch them like that. That's cool too. Um, grass carp, common carp, catfish um i mean i've caught bass and bluegill doing this i last year i caught a, a master angler gold eye on one speaking of gold eye winnipeg gold eyes here um so yeah anyway yeah, get out and fish for the mulberry fish right now if you have the chance um i can't give you any specific spots to go but what i would look for if you're looking to catch mulberries fish around here um it's bodies of water first off that have carp and it's going to be areas of these reservoirs and lakes that are kind of untouched by people like they're you know it's like and it's going to be the older lakes around here which there are a lot you know we have a lot of them that are you know 30 over 30 years now omaha metro zarinski weirspan um i mean all of the all of the salt valley reservoirs at this point have sections of the lake that are undeveloped that potentially have you know any of those potentially have like big mulberry trees that hang over the water and your typical carp fishing technique you do not want to splashing your fly down above a fish is going to spook them nine times out of ten For, even more than that probably 99 times out of 100 you, you know you plop your fly down hard under on a carp and it's going to spook them you can line them a little bit if you're careful, but really the fly plopping down and making like an, a ring of, you know, that's, that's spooking carp. During mulberry fishing, that's the exact opposite. It's you want your fly to plop, land, with a, land with a nice plop. If you cast with a nice tight loop, it unfolds and plops down, you know, and makes that nice O-ring splash. Um, that's exactly what, that's exactly the sound a mulberry makes when it, drops and that's what causes the fish to come in they literally feel it and hear it first and then they see it and then they'll come eat it i saw some fish this last weekend i there was a bunch of fish in like a tight overhanging spot i had to cast over weeds i was in my boat under a tree so it's you know you have to get it in this window so i couldn't it, it was hard for me to cast it in front of a fish but i can't i plopped this fly down and instantly, all, like 10 carp, the carp that I didn't even see just, just like looked up and started just mouthing on the surface. So they knew something dropped down and they heard it. And instinctively, they turned up and started eating, you know, started clooping on the surface. So anyway, if you're going to try to catch carp, now's the time to do it. You know, your Fremont Lakes, twin, you know, Louisville has some carp, I think. They've renovated a lot of those. You know, two rivers. I mean, then and then you get further out west. And a lot of, the, you know, if you name it, there's probably tons of mulberry trees. I just haven't ever fished out there, you know, this time of year. And this is a short window. Really, um, probably by mid-July, it's really start the mulberry fishing will just wind down. There'll, there'll be some trees that are still dropping. Um, there's some trees that will drop all summer. They'll drop throughout August even. But really, the majority of them are, it's a really short season. They kind of just drop 
from now until maybe the July 15th, you know, that weekend is when it, you know, and the carp will still hanging around there, they, you know, they'll be kind of tuned into like, oh, there's the, there's been this fish feeder that's just dropping food for me. Um, so, you, you know, you can some, catch some hangers on that are around, but uh, yeah, it's a short window. So get out and do it now if you can get, if you have time. Well, I can attest that uh, we're in full mulberry season because of my driveway and the side of my house. Uh, I have a neighbor that has a mulberry tree, so my kid, the birds, we the snuck birds out today. Slats, uh, they're they're everywhere. Yeah, I work um, in Malibu, so there's a trail there, you know, on the on the east side of town there, and there's a <laughs> there's just, there's a bunch of mulberry trees on it, and I I was lucky enough to take my kid out there. And we just we just got covered in berry juice. <laughs> it was great. Um, have you ever fished uh, cotton flies? Yes, um, my the cotton fly I like to what I like to use for cotton flies, which that is going on right now too. Um, believe it or not, I'm actually a fan of just using a, an unweighted soft hackle when they're eating cotton fluff. It might sound counterintuitive, but carp are what carp are very opportunistic feeders i know that again that's not that doesn't that's not like normal fishing convention like you'd think carp or i don't know what i don't know what people think carp are because i have my own experience catching them um but something that sink you can get in front of them and have it sink a little bit next to their face they'll eat it um, or that at least they'll react to it if they can see it so that's one one thing you can use when they're up you know mouth and that cotton fluff flies if you can kind of drift, a, you know, or, or strip is not the right word. You're kind of dapping. You're kind of moving it with your rod tip past them, you know, past, where they can literally see it. It has to, you have to get really close to do it. Um, but a nymph, you know, strip right past their face can get them, they'll just react to it. Um, the other fly I like to use is just a white or a khaki salmon egg. Now, I know a lot of, you know, you, you, maybe folks have seen in books or, or articles, like people will tie, people will tie these big bushy things out of like marabou that look like they, like in the air and out of the water, they look like cotton fluff. When cotton fluff hits the water, it kind of shrinks down to just like this little tiny glob of orb. Um, and I'm just a fan of using, I like, I, this is where I would just, get maybe the you know the size if you're if you know you're going to tie cotton fluff flies maybe the size 10 uh 10 or 12 of that c14s that smaller size and just tie a, a white egg fly um white egg flies and the, you, i mean you could it could be as simple as some of this white baby blanket material just wrapped on a hook too and just tied similar to you know one of these or you could i mean if you're really if you're, if you're really just wanting to get out and fish from, you can even glue a pom pom, one of those craft pom poms. You know, just give yourself a thread base, put a dab of super glue on there, and just pinch a, a craft pom pom on there. And that's an egg fly. Um, and it's okay. Honestly, you can grease those up and have them just float on the surface. But again, that very slow, almost neutral buoyant below the surface, first off, it gets your fly away from all the fluff that's on the top. Second, it lets it lets your fly get differentiated among the food chain up above. If you right, and that 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 was my uh, when I've seen carp sipping uh, cotton off the water, it's not white. It's right. it's saturated with water and it's just hardly even visible, but it's there. Yep. So a soft tackle to me would be much better. You see a lot of um, white CDC. Uh, just a little bit of white CDC. If you could make it very sparse, then maybe it would be uh, okay. But um, to me, any anything that would just drop below the surface, like you said, that to, to separate it from that scum that's everywhere. Yeah, separate it from the buffet line, basically. Um, right. If you're going to do the CDC route or like a or like a white soft hackle, you know maybe a spot in the middle of, where, of your hook shank just like really tie some you know tie some white thread there to give it like a little little spot of white because that's and if you again if you look at a cotton fluff it's like this big poof and then right in the middle of white, it is like white one, seed the seed so yep again but 
I have a lot of luck this time of year just using, you know, a dark, just literal bug looking nymph, you know, a soft tackle nymph. And that, again, it, it's kind of counterintuitive. You're not like matching the hatch, but you're standing out from their, the food line. Now, if it's grass carp that are eating up there, you do, you know, that, that is probably where you want to use like an egg fly, something a little bit more substantial because they'll see it. Um, and you can even go bright from there too. You can use like, you know, you can do a, a chartreuse egg and that that's that chartreuse, believe it or not, it's, it's weird. I don't know why, but sh like bright, that bright egg. And I think it's just cause again, I think it's just cause they see it better. Really? That's, I think that's it. And it works really well. So the, you know, a couple of local guys around here have, Cooperated that like independently from me even telling them like they've started using like chenille eggs with like a little tail on them and they're slamming grass carp on those because again grass carp eat grass yes. i mean they eat plant matter first as so, we oh, i, I wanted to ask you about that for uh this carp invitational or tournament or whatever you want to call it lake ogallala does it have a lot of grass carp None. No, it's all common. So yeah, Lake, Lake McConaughey, Lake Ogallala, there's, I mean, there's buffalo species in there. That's not carp though. And okay, that's a totally, that's a different ball game anyway. Um, so no, it's all common carp. Lake McConaughey, Lake Ogallala is commons only. Um, well, there's other there, there's drum and yeah, there's some suckers and stuff, but yeah. I feel bad because uh, I did that fly box for the tournament. Yeah. And half of the fly box was a fly called Sister Carol's grass carp fly. So if you ever do have a lake that has grass carp, are they in the Papio and different rivers yeah, and streams so, and stuff? Yeah, anywhere, anywhere that I would say the Pat the Platte River east of Grand Island and the, the Missouri River south of uh Gavin's Point. Okay. So any tributaries west or east or north and south off of that off of there yeah that's yeah that's that's awesome i mean i've literally seen grass carp i've seen grass carp munching cattail stalks that are literally like a foot and a half long, like eating them like a piece of spaghetti so a big honk and thing like that it it's not gonna it's not what i would reach to for a lot of the time um but it would work. I mean, it would definitely, there's a time and a place that that would really work. If you that's, have, that's called uh, Sister Carol's grass carp fly. Elmer, uh, Elmer Mueller hooked me up with a couple of those. Really? Years. It's, um, the closest thing that I found is this, um, that brand of, of yarn and it was like in a craft store. Craft yep. store. That's and some good looking stuff. That looks awesome. It looks, it looks more like pond weed than but it does also have a it's got some peacock in there too yeah and so i did like about probably 20 of those and i have one side of the fly box with those and the other side with carp flies and so well um i mean for if they're not if there aren't any in there then i'll just replace those with some other flies or spread them out or something but yeah I mean, that, that, um, just real quick, Mike, those would be good around, around here. Um, you know, some of the backwaters, you know, potentially some of the backwaters off the, the Missouri, if, if vets ever get out there, um, like the Dodge parks and like the, um, Indian Creek or not, not Indian Creek, Indian cave down in the South, you know, down South there. Um, some of those, some of those little old marinas that don't really exist anymore, just because they've been flooded a thousand times. You know, that's where that's like a accessible. I put that in air quotes, but like, you know, heavy grain of salt, accessible spot for grass carp. For right. People. Anywhere that maybe an oxbow off the Missouri or. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Guys, farm, gonna, farm ponds or other things. I'm going to shut off the uh, Facebook feed and. Okay. Uh, give me a second here. That's the uh, harp hybrid worm, right? Yes. Basically. So yeah, yeah. So that's essentially what I just tied, but just with a right, right. With just with a different tail material, yep. really. So it, yeah. So and that and. It,